everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, discussing a soon-to-be-released feature in Aura software that automates collecting bioluminescent kinetics curves and ensures that you're quantifying at peak. Today, Dr. Andrew Van Prague will not only be presenting what this feature is and how to use it, but he will discuss some compelling data to show you why quantifying at peak is so important to your bioluminescent studies. Um, as the lead application scientist for Spectral, Andrew frequently works with customers and provides advanced training and model development consultations. So he really saw the need for this feature firsthand on a near daily basis and was instrumental both in dreaming up the feature as well as doing in-field testing with real customer mouse models to make sure that it would provide what was needed. So without further ado, Dr. Andrew, take it away. Melanie, thank you so much for those kind words of introduction. Um, it's very exciting, really, to have the opportunity to talk to you all today about Spectral's newest Aura software feature, Kinetics. And as Melanie mentioned, this feature is designed to really optimize the sensitivity and the reproducibility of your bioluminescent imaging in your animal models. So I'm sure most of you know that with regard to bioluminescent imaging, the bioluminescent signal itself is a bit of a moving target, right? In any animal model system where you have to inject substrate to supply the luciferase enzyme um, with the materials needed to generate, the amount of light that you get will be a product of the time post-injection of that substrate. Essentially, you're dependent on the pharmacokinetics of that substrate as it passes through the animal, finds the cells that are expressing the luciferase, and then generates the light. And typically what you're going to generate, if you would look at a time course post-injection, is a rise phase of the amount of signal generated, followed by a steady-state kinetic where all of available enzyme is um, engaged with substrate, so you get maximum production, and then followed by a fall phase as the amount of substrate available declines and you'd have less produced. Overall, this phenomena of a rise, plateau, and fall phase is referred to as a bioluminescent kinetic curve. And this is exactly what kinetics focuses on. It focuses on the automatic acquisition of the data needed to construct a bioluminescent kinetic curve for your mouse model system. And it will provide a live graph as this data is acquired. And at the end of acquisition, it will give you a summary table of all of the data acquired so that knowing when peak occurs, you can then go ahead to the table and extract the data you need. Now, before going into any further detail on the software feature and how it's used and the data that we have to date, it's important, I think, to go ahead and just sort of set the playing field, if you will, and reintroduce the basics of optical imaging, what its central features are, and its overall popular applications to get everyone on the same playing field before we go into detail on the uh, nature of bioluminescent kinetic curves, and then uh, the specifics of the capabilities of the kinetic software feature. So as many of you I'm sure already know, optical imaging is simply the capture of visible and near infrared light photons ranging in wavelengths from just below 400 nanometer all the way up through the visible spectrum and up into the near infrared at about a thousand nanometer. And typically the photons um, are generated in one of two ways in most of our animal um, in vivo optical imaging systems. We will use bioluminescence, which requires an intracellular enzyme, a luciferase, to generate light in the presence of its substrate. In this case, with Firefly from uh, Photonis paralis, um, you will use d luciferin You'll have cellular ATP and oxygen as being required elements for the production of light. Fluorescence is the other major imaging modality within optical imaging, and that makes use of single molecules, fluorophores, that will have electrons that will go into an excited state at last myth after being exposed to excitation. We're going to focus exclusively today on bioluminescence. Now, this is what optical imaging looks like in the lab. Um, we have off to the left our benchtop workhorse unit, the Amy HTX from Spectral, and our flagship um, device, the uh, Spectral Logo X. Uh, and in both images, 
if you look carefully, there is the use of anesthesia. And this is really one of the things I wanted to emphasize that when you're doing acquisitions of in vivo optical imaging data, you will, of course, want the mice to be still and fully anesthetized. And this is achieved by making use of an anesthesia system that will induce the mice uh, into uh, an anesthetized state and keep them anesthetized uh, during imaging. If all things go well, so have the. All right. So, what are some of the key features? Uh, in other words, the advantages that are unique to in vivo optical imaging. And, and there's why is it part of the pantheon? of imaging modalities that are present in the preclinical research space. Well, chief amongst these is the fact that in vivo optical is highly sensitive. What we're looking at here is a molecular level event. And uh, you do not need, as in the, is the case for other high resolution imaging modalities, such as micro CT or um, you know, MR, the presence of pathological uh, uh, anatomical f uh, features you actually are able to detect the production of light at a molecular level. So it's very, very sensitive. And with that sensitivity, you have early onset detection of the success or failure, let's say, of the engraftment of the cell line that you're working with in the mouse model. The collection of light is inherently a non-invasive process, right? So that enables you to basically look at the same cohort of mice over time. And this will dramatically reduce the variability that you would see from using different cohorts of mice over a time course study. Now, optical imaging is also very fast. Typically with bioluminescence and even with fluorescence, you are talking about a matter of seconds, five to 10 seconds for image acquisition. And therefore you have results that are in real time. In general, the field of view for optical is multi-mouse. Uh, it's certainly in the case with our spectral aura and you can image five mice at a time. And with our spectral X, you can image as many as 10 mice. So this is a very high throughput screening modality in contrast to other imaging modalities, which image typically one mouse at a time. Now, given the fact that you're non-invasive and you're looking at multiple mice, you also have the capacity to basically detect whole animal reporter biodistributions. And this can be very useful in various model uh, setups, primal amongst them being oncology, if you're looking to evaluate the occurrence or absence of metastatic lesions following the growth of the primary tumor. Optical imaging does not work alone. It can be used in concert with other imaging modalities, such as planar 2D x-ray, which we make available in our MEHT and in our LIGO system. And co-registration with x-ray can be informative as to the meaning of the optical set you get. You can co-register with other imaging modalities, such as PET, SPEC, or CT, and we make this available through our collaborations with uh, molecules. Now, given these capabilities, what are some of the key research applications um, that optical is being used for? Well, we've already sort of given this away a bit, um, that in general, optical can be used for monitoring the distribution of targeted eukaryotic cell lines, bacteria and viruses, and any kind of theranostic agent um, that you may be interested in treating or affecting certain cell populations. Specific examples of the monitoring of the distribution and extent of certain events can be, are indeed listed here. You can monitor for the distribution of tumors and any metastatic lesions that may occur. You can evaluate drug efficacies versus targeted cell populations, the occurrence of gene knockout or knockout events, um, and their effects in targeted cell populations. This is commonly done with adeno-associated virus pre-recombinate systems. Um, you can look at nanoparticle delivery of various uh, uh, therapeutic agents in the form of DNA, siRNA, uh, or, and or any candidate molecule therapeutics. And um, interestingly, you can monitor the uh, distribution and efficacies of an eight and acquired immune systems. Um, and this is done uh, frequently when looking at activated uh, macrophages and neutrophils um, and or the uh, derivation of uh, patient-derived CAR T cells and where they distribute ego. And we'll, in fact, present an example of that momentarily. And finally, protein-protein uh, -protein interactions, as another example, uh, can be monitored through bioluminescence imaging. So given these capabilities, 
where is in vivo optical imaging used? Well, there's a whole range of disciplines that can make use of these capabilities. And top amongst these are the disciplines of oncology, immunology, immuno-oncology, inflammation, fibrosis, um, and uh, bacterial and viral infection studies, and certainly cardiovascular uh, disease. What uh, follows here is just a quick uh, sampling of some of the most common uh, applications visualized by actual data. Okay, so again, uh, firefly luciferase being amongst the chief luciferases uh, that is used uh, in the preclinical research space. I use that here as an example where it serves uh, from the firefly as a uh, genetic source that can then be used uh, to, for transaction or transfection of various cell lines, bacteria, eukaryotic or viral, and then injected into your mouse model system. And with the in injection of substrate, you will be able to monitor things like tumor growth. Here, what we're looking at on the right-hand side is an ectopic tumor on the right thigh of 10 mite OS. We can also look at the orthotopic uh, placement of lung cancer cells inside a mouse model system. And uh, in this case, it's kind of interesting. Um, we are looking at uh, the use of two different reporter constructs. One is BRET and the other is BLI. BRET is simply bioluminescence resonance energy transfer. And as you can see through the graphic, you have a blue uh, luciferase, which will, um, in the presence of its substrate, generate light that then activates the uh, emission of light from a orange floor. And so you basically are able to use fluorescence without any kind of external excitation light. And this leads to great silicon. And this is, in fact, why the investigators used it to determine the biodistribution of target tumor cells. Okay? So uh, the... The, the tumors uh, here in the lower left uh, thigh region of the, of the experimental mice are then treated either with specific uh, uh, CAR T cells. In other words, these are patient-derived tumor cell lines that were then used to generate uh, specific T cells or it, um, the efficacy of non-specific CAR T cells against the same uh, tumor population. And you can see by comparison um, uh, of the intensity of signal that the Specific CAR T cells have a greater efficacy in reduction of the tumor mass, and their biodistribution is tighter to the tumor cell site than the non-specific CAR T cell. So this is just a quick snapshot of the kinds of studies that you can do with BLI and why it's and so valuable to a lot of preclinical research investigators. Now we're going to pivot and take a closer look at the phenomena of bioluminescent kinetic curves. There are phases why plateau data is important, and what are some of the causes for the variability that you will see even within an, an, a specific animal model system with regard to the time of uh, plateau or peak uh, bioluminescence, uh, bioluminescence kinetics and the amplitude. So many of you have seen images like this before, and we've already discussed this. We have a rise plateau and fall phase to the... Uh, amount of bioluminescence signal relative to time post-substrate injection. And by and large, um, one could argue that this is due to the uh, <clears throat> uh, pharmacokinetics uh, of the substrate through the animal model system. Now, you can see we have some color coding here, which is not too subtle, in that the plateau phase is really the region of the kinetic in which you want to acquire your data, green is go. And the reason for this is that it will provide you optimal sensitivity. It will also provide you the opportunity to have optimal reproducibility. You can see that during the steady state kinetic phase or the plateau phase of bioluminescence signal production, there is very little change. Okay, so this will allow you to have highly re reproducible data over the time course of your study. And Secondly, um, well, I should say thirdly, an additional point, which is a bit more subtle, is that plateau phase quantities of bioluminescent signal are the only part of the overall kinetic curve that is actually tightly correlated with the biology of your model. And let's just analyze that a bit. So the biology of your model, uh, by that I mean the amount of cells, and within that, the number of luciferase enzymes in your model at any given time. And steady state kinetics is the only one that shows the maximum amount 
of light production by your model at that time point. And that maximum production is going to be a function of the number of luciferase enzymes, i.e. the number of cells of interest in your model. So it is really behooven on an investigator to exclusively report uh, from their bioluminescent mouse model system in terms of plateau or peak kinetic data. Now, this is uh, a, a bit of a, a deep dive into other aspects of the physiology and anatomical reality of a um, bioluminescence mouse model system that can affect the overall uh, amplitude and shape of your bioluminescent kinetic curve. We've already discussed the first category, which is the systemic biodistribution of your substrate. There is also a factor um, with regard to the penetration of the substrate into different major organs of the mess. As a very commonly uh, and well-established example, um, blood brain barrier can inhibit the penetration of D-luciferin into the brain space. And this is very clearly demonstrated here in this example, where we're looking at um, very low levels of flux, total signal of photons per second, in the absence of in normal physiological conditions, right? Now, with the addition of an efflux pump inhibitor, uh, KO143, um, the amount of deleucifrin that's able to build up in the brain space increases, and it's a dose-responsive manner. As you increase this inhibitor, you are able to get greater and greater amounts of deleucifrin that can um, be delivered to the brain space and therefore greater and greater amounts of emitted light. And what one can see additionally, um, beyond the uh, elevation and amplitude of the kinetic curves, there is an overall change in the shape as well. And so both parameters can be affected. Now, um, we've also uh, talked about the uh, change in the, or the relevance of the number of cells in affecting the maximum value of your bioluminescence signal achieved during steady state or plateau phase kinetics. The thing that's interesting is that that number, of course, can change, right? And so as you proceed through the time course of a study, the maximum value will increase of your bioluminescence signal can increase by orders of magnitude as far as total photons per second. There's a secondary effect, which is that not only will the amplitude increase, but the onset of plateau peak phase can change um, as far as minutes post substrate injection. What you can see on day three of this study of a solid state tumor is that peak kinetics really didn't happen until after 20 minutes uh, injection. And as the time passed in the study, this amount of time declined and the rate at which um, uh, the, or I should say the duration of the uh, plateau phase lessened. And this is all due to the rising number of cells that are consuming the luciferase substrate injected. It's happening faster and therefore you reach peak earlier. And because it's happening faster, you consume the substrate quicker and plateau phase lasts for a shorter period of time. If one was not aware of this and simply wanted to go ahead and use a fixed time point for measuring their bioluminescent data, you can see what would happen in this uh, second graph over here to the right. The optimal data um, is a product of the time when you measure. And for the first couple of time points in a study, let's say less than five days, um, you would have want to have measured at 20 minutes to get peak kinetic data. However, as the time uh, course progressed, the actual time point for measurement probably would go back to 10 minutes. And that would remain the best time point for measuring um, your overall bioluminescence uh, peak data. So the actual time point of measurement can, um, the optimal time point of measurement, I should say, for getting peak kinetic data can vary even within a single study's time course. Now, not all luciferases emit photons at the same wavelength, right? We know that Firefly uh, typically is a, a, a crowd favorite in that it emits light in the far red and therefore has very little issue with tissue absorptions, relatively speaking, to other more bluer luciferases. The old saying of redder is better, 
right? Um, so Firefly, Click Beetle Red, these luciferases will have will offer you greater sensitivity, um, and their amplitudes as far as uh, bioluminescent curves go will be higher than if you were using Redella or a bacterial luciferase. And so the identity of the luciferase that you're using will uh, affect your kinetic curve as well. Finally, your system of detection is critical, right, to your overall detection sensitivity. And um, with the log OX from Spectral, you have the lowest in the uh, market uh, flux required for detection. At 45 photons per second, there is really no system that is more sensitive. And this can make a difference in your early onset of detection of signal at uh, time points in your study. Now, by way of a quick review, plateau peak kinetics uh, is the time point at which you want to acquire your data because it optimizes sensitivity, reproducibility, and um, the correlation of data to the biology of the model. So in a feature like kinetics, we would like it to basically automatically acquire and quantify the uh, BL kinetic data over time. We would like it to provide a live real-time bioluminescent kinetic uh, curve in a graphic format and present both the individual mouse data and uh, perhaps group mean data. And then finally, we would like to be able to identify off of that graph the actual values of total emission in terms of photons per second um, that were being produced by your mouse model, again, at plateau phase time points. Now, the good news is that or our spectrals uh, or platform with its uh, a new kinetics software feature does all of the above. And this is what we're going to demonstrate next. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the overall um, structure of the homepage of uh, Spectral's Aura software platform. And kinetics is part of the uh, camera ribbon down at the bottom left. And when you select it, it will uh, highlight in orange. And what we're going to do now is basically walk through the very simple, uh, nearly fully automated uh, uh, protocol for running a, um, a kinetic curve evaluation. Okay, so this assumes that all of your mice are ready to go. And um, what you can do initially is select kinetics, determine if you were going to be imaging five or 10 mice at a time. And the reason why this is important, as you will see, the position of the manifold for five mice um, is at 90 degrees to the position for the 10 mouse manifold. And so the drawing of ROIs will be dependent on the number of mice selected here. Um, the total runtime typically runs about 30 minutes. You can run it longer, um, but uh, typically you will uh, want to image on a one or two minute or three minute interval. So by way of example here, the defaults are 30 minutes at one minute intervals. Now, once you've done that, you hit acquire and a second window will pop up. And this is a very key and important parameter to enter incorrectly is how long ago were the injections either initiated or started? You'll have to be consistent on that front um, to have meaning across your various different kinetic curve valuations. Typically, we use uh, the time of onset of first dosing and the amount of time that passed before you're ready to go ahead and click submit. With submit, you will basically launch the kinetic software. And this is the kind of data that you will get. And so let me just walk through what we're seeing here. Basically, off to the uh, left here, you're seeing a summary presentation of all the individual images that were acquired during the kinetic run. And this is all done automatically. I want to emphasize that as well as the region of interest analysis or the ROI analysis on all of those five mites. Okay. Now, <clears throat> if you want to um, alter the whole mouse ROI, that is the default, you can readily do this um, during your acquisition, let's say to the brain or to the liver or to the heart, and specifically get a uh, region of interest analysis for those subregions of the overall mouse uh, anatomy. Now, as you're acquiring data, there will be a live graph that is generated off of the ROI 
analysis of the images acquired to date. And it'll be basically a plot of total photons per second from the ROI analysis versus time post-injection. You will get, as you can see here, not only individual mouse data, okay, but an overall group mean or average uh, data on a per time point basis. And at the end of the kinetic acquisition, you will be given uh, a data summary of the all the uh, ROI data that was generated during the acquisition. And this, of course, is important because what you're going to end up doing is going to a time point in which plateau occurred, let's say 12 minutes, and then go down and identify um, the output either of the average or of the individual mouse data at that time point and use that in your reporting of your bioluminescent mouse model. Okay, nice features here are that the data, of course, is going to be automatically saved. Both the acquired images and the live graph are saved in the Aura file, and the uh, uh, summary graph can be saved as a CSV file. This is simply a blow up of one of the images acquired during the kinetic run, and I'm including it here because I want to emphasize the fact that you can readily access these images and get their camera set. So let's say that you have selected an image that happened during plateau and you know it took place uh, 15 minutes in not just a pilot study in which you're collecting your kinetic data, but later on during a full-scale mouse model, let's say efficacy evaluation, where you're dealing with not just five mice, but 60 mice, you can use um, the, the timing of plateau along with the camera set values of the images acquired during plateau in a predictive fashion to get high intensity, non-saturated images of your mice during your large scale study. In other words, you don't have to run kinetics in a large, uh, uh, high mouse number situation. You can simply run it as a scanning pilot feature in a, a preliminary pilot study of five to 10 mice. So for the upcoming examples or demonstrations of um, the kinetic feature in live mouse model systems, I just want to emphasize uh, some of the common protocols that we used in all cases. Firefly Lucifer's was the bioluminescence reporter. The um, mice were all uh, prepared for kinetic imaging following this sequential um, animal handling. We would go ahead and inject with delucifer substrate subcutaneously at 150 mix per king. And we would then anesthetize the mice using uh, two to two and a half percent axoferrate vapor, induction chamber, transfer the mice to um, the LAGO or MEHDX imagers, and go ahead and maintain that anesthetic uh, state by exposing the mice to two to two and a half percent axoferrate vapor um, through the mouse manifold. Right, pretty simple. And this is uh, a first example where we actually were using a logo X to image 10 mice at a time and actually looking at two different uh, uh, oncology models, uh, B-cell leukemia in the first uh, set of mice, one through five, located off to the left here. Okay. And then in mice uh, numbers six to 10, we were looking at a myeloma model. And what you can see um, by way of overall data presentation is that when you go from five mice to 10 mice, you don't simply have one graph, but you have two graphs. Um, and this allows you basically to look at different mouse cohorts at the same time where the cohorts are five mice in number. Okay. And what you can see, even just by preliminary glance here, is that indeed the overall uh, average kinetics uh, of the two models are different. And if you do a normalized presentation of the data and look at time of onset of peak, you can see that there's about a two minute difference. Um, in general, one is not going to be so fastidious in deciding when to exactly measure. Uh, typically, uh, plateau phase can be defined. And in this particular case, I've defined it as 95% max. And so that brought the time point at which you can uh, get your uh, analytical data from, if so wish. And uh, in this case, we're looking at about five and a half minutes per model for plateau phase. Okay, so one of the two studies uh, that was involved here, the B-cell leukemia model, we decided to take out and evaluate over a time course to see if 
the onset of peak kinetics would change over time, like we had seen in the literature. And interestingly, um, seven days later, at day 14 of the study, um, we did about a four minute um, earlier onset of peak, going from 12 to eight minutes. And we measured um, one week later at day 21 post challenge. And you can see that it's walking back a bit now, um, contrary to what we saw in the literature. And um, at day 27, we got something completely different. Okay. Where now the rock plateau and fall general shape of the bilumescent kind of curve had um, altered. Not only are we getting a delayed off the peak going from, let's say, as early as eight minutes out to 16 minutes, okay, pointing out the importance of knowing such data so that you get um, peak kinetic data, but there's really a much more gentle, if any, kind of fall off uh, of this signal once it reaches peak. So this is, um, you know, a, a question that, uh, or a phenomena that prompts questions as to exactly what is going on in the mouse model system. And one could conjecture a number of things, uh, amongst them being that the ability of uh, d luciferin substrate to penetrate the um, liquid tumor, if you will, which is what leukemia is, uh, has declined. And... Uh, as a result, the uh, pharmacokinetics there of the substrate being slower would lead to a uh, a decreased penetration to the cells with luciferase and therefore perhaps a longer sustained um, fall phase to the model. Now, this is actually a, a, a possibility that has been uh, evaluated and uh, discussed. Um, and we attempted to exemplify this in other studies that were conducted um, that were solid tumor mass models. Okay, so um, firstly, we looked at a long adenocarcinoma or LUAD model, and uh, this was nicely designed by the folks down uh, at MD Anderson, where uh, they went ahead and basically induced uh, an uh, oncogenesis by uh, pre recombinase, knocking out P53, LKD1, and inducing. Uh, firefly luciferase um, at a point eight days, um, uh, sorry, at day zero, and then analyzing uh, initially at eight days um, post recombinase exposure through the, uh, the trachea. Um, now, the images that we took were actually about four weeks after initial challenge. And what you can see here is what we saw in the latter phases of the liquid tumor model of the B cell uh, leukemia, where basically you have a rise and then a very delayed uh, uh, or long and protracted, if you will, uh, fall phase of the kinetic curve. So this solid phase tumor mass um, uh, may have, in fact, been mimicked as far as the kinetics of delucifrin by the uh, B cell leukemia model only at the later phases and only once the uh, the cell masses in the leukemia model had in fact become quote unquote solid, if you will, in that uh, they were so dense. And we saw visibly, I haven't shared this, but we saw uh, extensive uh, uh, bright signals, uh, extensive populations indicated by bright signals of bioluminescence in uh, many of the uh, uh, bones in the mouse model at that 20 day seven time point. So, we further uh, evaluated this question by looking at another solid state tumor model, a pancreatic ductal uh, DNA carcinoma model uh, by the same uh, group down at MD Anderson. And uh, this had a similar onset uh, lochogenesis uh, through Cre recombinase with KRAS and P53 knockout and luciferase induction. And uh, again, this is a limited number of N uh, of two, but we did see a similar sort of uh, rise and then long gradual die-off uh, of, of signal in the fall phase. Now, if um, folks are paying attention and into details here, one thing I'd like to point out is that there will be instances, of course, where you are not imaging either five or 10 mice at a time, right? And so in this early beta testing uh, evaluation of uh, the Connect software, we had all five ROIs drawn. That is not a necessity. You can, of course, uh, remove uh, any ROIs, automated ROIs that you don't need, and simply focus on uh, the ROIs evaluations of 
the mice that are being imaged. So by way of summary, the new uh, spectral aura kinetics feature will provide you with an automated acquisition and uh, real-time ROI analysis of the BL, uh, the bioluminescent kinetic data from your mouse model system. It will, as a result, uh, provide you an automatic real-time uh, graph of that data in terms of total photons per second uh, versus time post uh, substrate injection. And uh, at the end of acquisition, you will have a summary table of all of that ROI um, BL kinetic data uh, presented that can be exported. The graph, of course, will enable you to easily identify when peak kinetics happens. The table will enable you to determine exactly what that total photons per second value is. And all of this information can be saved for later analysis in the form of a .org file uh, and as a CSD file as far as the uh, summary table is concerned. And with that, I would be happy to take uh, any questions that have been generated in chat. Thank you for your attention.